for inviting me to come and speak to you. Let's see. How far am I away from this? Am I too far away from this, or are you okay? Because it is not going to get any closer to me. <laughs> and I'm afraid that I'm probably not. I don't know. That's not going to work. <laughs> we'll just have to do the best we can. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to come and, and talk to you about the soldiers' home during the Civil War. Um, it's a project that I've been working on for a long time on and off. And it's a project that it turns out is quite a bit different than what most people think it is, as you will come to see as we talk about it. Because, well, we'll get there. <laughs> Um, Joe Biagi, who was a soldier of the 124th Illinois Infantry, was on his way home to Aurora, Illinois, on furlough during the summer of 1864. And he noted in his diary on July 16th, we got to Chicago at 9 o'clock, that would be p.m., went to Soldier's Rest and got a good supper, coffee and meat and bread. The train for Aurora does not run until tomorrow night. On July 17th, the next day, he noted, got our breakfast here at Soldier's Rest at 10 o'clock a.m., same as supper. We had dinner at 3 p.m., and then he left that night on the, the 9 o'clock train. Now, apparently, Yagi was one of the 761 arrivals at the Soldier's Rest in the week before July 23rd, and he ate three of the 1,865 meals that were served there that week. So... What exactly was a soldier's rest? And the thing is that the soldier's rest is essentially synonymous with a soldier's home, uh, if you happen to be in the north. In the south, it would be a, a wayside home or a wayside hospital most often, although they might call it a soldier's home too, or a soldier's rest. But these things, these soldier's home, soldier's rest, wayside homes, whatever you want to call it, uh, were found in both the North and the South, um, widely spread uh, in both areas. And the purpose of these soldiers' homes, which clearly the next time I do this talk I'm going to have to change the name, but anyway, these soldiers' homes' uh, main purpose was to meet the needs of soldiers in transit, okay? Soldiers in transit in small groups or, or individuals, people who are going to or from their regiment, um, home from the hospital, um, maybe they're on furlough, uh, sick furlough, they're healthy but they're on furlough. Um, sometimes they're going to run errands for their regiment or they have some other military business that takes them away from their regiment. Um, some of them have been discharged and are on their way home, some are on their way to the regiment for the first time. So there are all kinds of reasons why folks, why soldiers would be traveling um, by themselves or in small groups. Um, and they may have a pass, but that's all they've got. Where are they going to get food? Where are they going to get shelter? Uh, they tend not to get paid very regularly, so they tend not to be traveling with money. And if you've got convalescents and the sick uh, who are on their way home or back to the regiment, they're not super well, or some of these people get sick on the way, you know, what are they going to do? So that's what these facilities are for. They're always providing temporary care. Uh, they're not setting up anything for long term. It's not a home for the whole, for the uh, elderly, it's not a home for the disabled soldiers, it's, it's not a permanent thing, it's temporary care, so that's what these are all about. Now they're located in major cities, they're located in small towns, it, it really doesn't matter as long as they're on some transportation route, either um, railroad or boat and especially where transportation routes tend to join or to cross. Um, 
you know, often transportation does not coordinate. Our friend Yegi, as we saw, spent 24 hours in Chicago waiting for his train. And so they, uh, these homes attempted to take care of soldiers in that situation. Now, the homes varied as to exactly what they did, depending on where they were and what time of the war it was. Um, some of the homes only provided food, others food and lodging, a uh, few were only hospitals, and many of them were a combination of one sort or another. Now, the establishment of one of these soldiers' homes was always dependent on the needs of the soldiers coming through that particular place at that particular time when they established these. Um, and actually, these homes could be established at any time during the war, but they were more common during the last several years. Now, for example, just to look at some of these homes and how they got started, the home in Washington, D.C. was one of the earliest ones. And we're not talking about the soldiers' home where Lincoln stayed. We're talking about a, a place for soldiers in transit uh, down near uh, the railroad station, actually. There was one established by Frederick Knapp, who was an agent for the U.S. Sanitary Commission. And it was established about August of 1861. Now, the problem, of course, here in Washington is you've got all of these cut, uh, these soldiers arriving. Um, some of them are, you know, as small groups that are wandering around. They don't know how to find their regiment. Uh, the soldiers who are arriving are poorly supplied, poorly organized. They don't have food. Some of them got sick on the way. Uh, they're not sick enough to go to a hospital, but somebody needs to do something to take care of them. You've got soldiers who are arriving in Washington with physical conditions that clearly indicate that they should not have been mustered in, in the first place. But as you know, uh, many of these uh, soldiers were not very well examined to begin with. I mean, considering that there were a number of women who um, <laughs> ended up in the Army, the examination was not very thorough. <laughs> but um, we have, anyway, you know, soldiers who, who disguised other things like um, they were developing tuberculosis and uh, you know, other sorts of issues that they had, that once they got there and they realized, oh, well, you know, we really can't live under the conditions we're going to have to live under, and people said, well, these people should be discharged. Well, so they're waiting for their paperwork. So some of these people show up at home. Uh, they need travel funds, and that's something that, that the home, in this case, provides. And it's, it also simply provides a place for these traveling soldiers to clean up. You know, traveling is dirty business, especially during this period. So, this initial home in Washington, D.C. is set up basically to meet the basic problems of ill-supplied, new soldiers. Now another poem, um, in, in contrast really, is in Charleston, South Carolina. They had a wayside home already, but in the summer of 1863, there's a movement to establish something else, or at least to expand it, because um, these Confederate soldiers are getting some R&R &R time, so they're on break from the defense duty that they've been doing on the Sea Islands. And so they come to Charleston, and they're being ripped off. The hotel people, um, those who are providing food, you know, they, they want to charge a great deal for these services. And the Charleston Courier editorialized on July 23rd of 1863 that, um, that the soldiers must not be left to the tender mercies of extortioners and of the shopkeepers who claim exemption from reserve duty for the purpose of making money out of the soldiers. It will take nearly a month's pay to give a soldier a good day's refreshment and lodging in a hotel. This must not be allowed. So actually, the folks of Charleston paid attention to what the newspaper said, and by a week later, um, as of July 29, Charleston had established a second wayside home. 
to take care of these soldiers who were temporarily in the city. So, the purpose of this hall was to protect the soldiers from the hotel and shopkeepers. Now, the, the Springfield, Illinois Soldiers' Rest is basically set up for the opposite purpose, to protect the town from the soldiers. <laughs> Um, in January 1864, John R. Woods, who was secretary of the Illinois State Sanitary Commission, wrote that uh, a soldier's rest was needed as a place of retreat and rest for the weary soldier who, coming from or returning to the camp and battlefield a stranger, exposed to the ruinous temptations that abound in a large city, sees a quiet and protected retirement, free from the noise, the fumes, and the dangers of the grog shop and gambling saloon, and where substantial refreshment and healthful repose await him. So, uh, the, the issue in, in Springfield is Camp Butler, of course. And Camp Butler, which exists throughout the war um, for organizing the regiments, training of troops, uh, mustering in, uh, people stop there on their way through uh, furloughs, mustering out, and it's also a prisoner of war camp. So, you know, it's, it's in use all the time. There are people coming and going all the time. But the thing is that it's six or seven miles out of Springfield. And so if your train gets in at 9 p.m., you're not going to get out there that night because how are you going to do that? So you have soldiers ending up in town with nowhere to go, nothing to eat, nowhere to stay, and so there is a fair amount of rowdiness and people get their fences torn down and various places get broken into and there's there's various kinds of messes. So um, they plan to set up a soldier's home basically to keep order in town. And Illinois Governor Richard Yates gets specific permission from Abraham Lincoln to build a rest on a government lot. In fact, there, there's a sign down there if you happen to have, have seen it uh, at the corner of, of Monroe and Sixth that has a picture of the home as it was eventually built. And they began work in late March of 1864, and it was finished in April. It opened April 21st, and it opened with a, a, a sanitary fair conducted by the Young Ladies uh, Soldiers Aid Society in Springfield raising funds um, for the home. An entirely different facility than these others uh, was the soldier's home that was founded in Centralia, Illinois. It's, it's a small town down near Mount Vernon. And at that point, it was on the Illinois Central Railroad. It was founded in 1853 specifically as a place uh, for the railroad repair shops. So it's, it's on that really key transportation line uh, between Cairo and Chicago. Now the problem that happened here was you know, the trains would stop, soldiers who were really too sick to go on, they'd put them off at the depot. What was there at the depot? Nothing but a depot. And so the women rallied, organized a soldiers' aid society sometime before June of 1863, and they initially cared for the soldiers either at the station or at the hotel. But they organized an actual soldiers' home um, in August of 1863. And their purpose was always strictly to provide medical care. They were not into anything else, but strictly to provide medical care for these folks who were too ill to go on. And it was never a large establishment. The most they ever had was 12 to 15 at a time. So, you know, it's entirely different from the ones we've talked about and some others that we'll talk about tonight. But just because a soldier's home was established, it doesn't mean that it existed for the rest of the war or that it existed in the same way for the rest of the war as the needs changed and homes also changed. So in Charleston, for example, we've already seen how an increased need led to opening a second uh, soldier's home or soldier's rest. In Chicago, the original soldier's rest, soldier's home, as they called it, opened in June of 1863. But the lady managers who were in charge of this 
came to see the need for a permanent home for the disabled, the kind of soldier's home that you think of when you hear soldier's home. And they established it in the old home while opening a new soldier's rest in February 1864 for transit soldiers. And the same ladies group ran both of these uh, organizations. In Montgomery, Alabama, uh, the Wayside Hospital there was established by the Ladies' Aid Society in June of 1861. They called it a soldier's home, but essentially it was a hospital. And by the late spring of 1862, it, they had moved into a larger building and become actually, they called themselves the Ladies' Hospital. And they became a regular part of the Confederate hospital system. So, you know, they went in another way as well. As did, in fact, Centralia. Uh, because of changes in the theater of war and the fact that not so many sick and wounded soldiers were coming through anymore, but more soldiers on reenlistment furloughs, the uh, Illinois Sanitary Commission agent suggested that they turn it into a feeding station in January of 1864. Well, the ladies had no funds for it or equipment for a feeding station, and they didn't apparently have any real interest in finding those funds or developing a feeding station. And so, in fact, the Centralia home closed down sometime in the summer of 1864. Occasionally, they still had some soldier put off the train, but, um, and they took care of them, you know, individually. But as of June 23rd, 1864, they had served a total of 195 patients, which compared to the other homes is, is a very small number, but for those 195, it was pretty key. Now, the question is then, who ran these homes once they were established? And some of them were run by the U.S. Sanitary Commission, the Western Sanitary Commission, the Christian Commission, uh, the different um, northern, national, or at least regional um, commissions. The Sanitary Commission, the most famous group founded in New York City in 1861, um, by a group of ladies, actually, but uh, taken over and run by a group of men who did the administration and the women did all the providing of supplies. Work. <laughs> yes, yeah, we could say the women did the work. Yes. Well, the men in the Sanitary Commission thought that they should be in charge of essentially all the Sanitary Commissions in the North, you know, all, all the subsidiary, the local Sanitary Commissions, the local ladies' aid uh, groups, and so forth, thought they should submit all their stuff to the Sanitary Commission, and so the Sanitary Commission could distribute it um, most expeditiously. But not everybody thought that was a good idea. Not all of these ladies wanted to do that. And in fact, in St. Louis, uh, a few months later, they organized the Western Sanitary Commission because they really saw no reason why people in New York would know how to meet the needs of Western soldiers. They could not figure that that was likely at all. So the U.S. Sanitary Commission had a number of homes that they established. Um, that the home at DC, in Washington DC that we mentioned already. They also had homes in Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, Hartford, Connecticut, Buffalo, New York, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, um, Detroit, Louisville, Paducah, Camp Nelson, Kentucky, Nashville, Memphis, Cairo, Jeffersonville, New Albany, Indiana. So there are a bunch of them that they they sponsor in one way or another. The Western Sanitary Commission has um, their headquarters um, in St. Louis, and they have a soldier's home in St. Louis, as well as um, one in Columbus, Kentucky, one in Memphis, uh, one in Helena, and at Duvall's Bluff, Arkansas, and one in Vicksburg, Mississippi, that we'll hear a little bit more about later. But the Christian Commission also, um, who were founded by a group of people from the YMCA who were distressed really that the other um, national sanitary commission types were managed by Unitarians. Um, and the Christian Commission really thought, I mean, they didn't, they were willing to administer to everyone, 
but they wanted to do it from a Protestant perspective. Not Catholic, not Jewish, not Unitarian, but uh, pretty standard Protestant. And so they established their own organization, and they too had several soldiers' homes, uh, a competing one in Memphis, for example, and a couple of other places as well. Now, still, these are by no means all the, the soldiers' homes in the North, and of course in the South, they don't have anything like uh, a major national or regional uh, organization like this. They had some state and local organizations, certainly. In Georgia, for example, there was a Georgia Relief and Hospital Association that was headquartered in Augusta. And they sponsored a wayside home in Augusta um, that was, that gathered uh, resources from not only Augusta, but from the countryside uh, quite some distance around it as well. And the Georgia Association also established a wayside home arrest for Georgia soldiers in Richmond. So it's, it's clear that um, states' rights and so forth was even uh, alive and well as far as medical care was concerned. Now, the Confederate's military medical system also was involved with some of these wayside homes and hospitals. Um, at least some of the ones uh, in the hospitals behind the lines, the general hospitals of the Confederate Army of Tennessee, were some of these wayside hospitals as well. But many of them were also um, under the charge of the local some local ladies' aid society. We saw that certainly in Centralia. And it, it's true in Chicago, it's true in Montgomery, Alabama, it's true in Augusta, it's true in other places as well. And this brings us to the whole matter of the role of women in the homes. Clearly, they're the ones, generally, who see the need for this kind of a home. And so they're the ones, generally, who are involved in establishing it. They tend to do the planning and organization. They tend to be the leaders to take the action in carrying it out. In Chicago, um, it was managed by a group of lady managers, and there were a bunch of them. They, they met weekly. There, there was one meeting, at least, reported in the newspaper, where there, where there were at least 60 ladies there. And although they had a man um, by the name of T.B. Bryan, who was a very well-to-do, um, influential person in Chicago, as the head of their organization, I mean, he was such a figurehead that they had to force him to accept re-election to the head of their um, organization. But they were the ones who ran it, and each week, three different ladies would be chosen to manage the rest. And when they had both the rest in the home, then they would have two or three other ladies chosen each week to manage the home. So, you know, a lot of people were involved. A lot of people um, were involved very responsibly. Now, women were also major fundraisers for these homes. They solicited and provided supplies in kind. They did nursing. Uh, and they worked at the home in various capacities. Some of them even lived at some of these homes. One of these was a woman by the name of Harriet Wiswall, um, or she went by Patty, at least to her friends. Um, she was from Princeton, Illinois, and was formerly a nurse at, at Benton Barracks in St. Louis, where she had served in 1863. And she wrote a series of letters to her stepmother which happily for me happened to be at the Presidential Library. And I got to catalog them and I was like, oh, oh, I know what this is about. <laughs> and so anyway, she talks about working as an assistant matron at the Soldiers' Home in Vicksburg, which was under the auspices of the Western Sanitary Commission. And she began working there in November of 1863 uh, and worked until May 1865, about the time of the home. Closed. Now, one of the things that she was especially responsible for was doing cooking. And one of the things about Vicksburg was that it was a major feeding station. They were feeding as many as 600 soldiers at a meal. And so she, she's writing to her stepmother, 
about uh, how many pies she baked. She baked 40 pies before 1 p.m. and they all were eaten at one meal. And you know, it's just like, she was doing a lot of cooking, shall we say. She eventually helped um, nurse the sick. At, at first they didn't have so many sick staying there, but eventually they did. And she did all sorts of other supervisory tasks and other things as needed. Now, the homes were supported and supplied just like any 21st century charity by fundraising. And fundraising was constant. As soon as somebody decided they needed to open a home, fundraising started right away. And of course, there were numerous ways to raise funds. Various kinds of events, certainly. Um, concerts, lectures, tableaus, the famous kind of strawberry party. Ch Chicago held a strawberry festival in June of 1863 to support their soldiers' home. And then there was always the sanitary fair. Now, the, the sanitary fair in Chicago in the fall of 1863 is kind of seen as the one that gets it all started. And certainly on a large scale it did, but the fundraising fair had been around certainly before that. And in fact, in 1862, um, there were some, some girls in Augusta who staged a, a much smaller scale fair to raise funds for their wayside home in Georgia. So clearly, the sanitary fair idea was not originated in Chicago. But the large size sanitary uh, fair certainly originated here and was copied all over the North. But at the sanitary fair, they would raise funds by charging admission to begin with. And then they'd have exhibits, they'd have entertainment, additional entertainment for an additional fee. They'd sell food, they'd sell various kinds of homemade items, they'd have raffles, they'd have contests that they'd sell tickets for, anything that they could raise uh, a little bit of money with. And uh, in fact, many of these sanitary fairs raised more than a little bit of money. They raised quite a lot. Another key to the, uh, the fundraising efforts were the newspapers. They were directly involved in fundraising and also indirectly in some ways. It's virtually everywhere where there was a soldier's home, in the north or the south, um, the newspaper would comment on it in one way or another. And a lot of information, especially about the more obscure of these homes, comes from the newspapers. As soon as they announced, whenever they announced their plans, if something was going to open, if they were going to construct, if they were going to hold meetings, uh, whatever, it would show up in the newspaper. The newspaper would report statistics on the home, how many people had stayed, how many people had eaten, uh, how many people had died, uh, whatever, because of course, unfortunately, some uh, soldiers did not make it out of those homes. Uh, they, re you know, they of course printed the requests for funds and solicited supplies. But they also sort of indirectly encouraged more donations by printing the names of all the donors and what they had given, whether it was money or specific items. And, of course, many of these um, responses to the funding raising ex uh, efforts were pretty substantial. I mean, some individuals just, they donated what they could. It might be a dollar. Some of the more well-to-do might uh, donate much larger amounts, like $100, for example. Uh, businesses, aid groups, uh, other groups that you never think of as, as donors. For example, the grand jury of Madison, Georgia, collected $86.10 that they donated to the Augusta home, uh, in one instance. But there was a lot of donation of supplies in kind, depending on the season and the location. And just, for example, for Augusta, Augusta Georgia, over um, a period of time, people donated peaches, eggs, butter, socks, 
dried fruit, sage, peppers, mustard, okra, lint, old linen, shirts, drawers, pickles, cabbage, turnip greens. In Chicago, they donated currants, dried apples, lettuce, pudding, tomato pickles, reams of paper, tobacco, stationery and blank books, iron bedsteads, potatoes, teaspoons, a patchwork bed quilt, ice cream, pickled beets, and two cows and a calf. And I'm sorry to report that one of the cows came to a sad end when it was hit by a train in October of 1864. So, but you know, you've got everything from condiments to, um, you know, substantial amounts of, of food to mattresses, to towels, to brooms, to, you know, the furniture that you need. So just every kind of thing and that you can imagine <coughs> or need might well be donated in kind. But not everyone was willing to help. In Chicago, for example, um, the proprietor of the Lake House Hotel was offered $3,000 a year uh, by the quartermaster to rent the, house, uh, the hotel for the soldiers' rest when they wanted to expand, you know, setting up the permanent soldiers' home and, and, and expand and develop a new rest. But he declined and he refused to rent it for less than $5,000 a year. And so as a consequence, they built uh, a new soldiers' rest. In other places, you know, not everyone was convinced that it was necessary to have these soldiers' homes. In Milwaukee, um, where they established their soldiers' home in April of 1864, because they had seen the example of the Chicago home and how it helped um, Wisconsin soldiers, uh, that it was that uh, example that they had to bring out and say, no, really, we've got so many soldiers coming through Milwaukee now that we really need to set up something like this as well. In time, too, some of the people who were originally enthusiastic about having a soldier's home or soldier's rest needed to have their support re-enlisted, and sometimes the newspapers were able to do this. But not all the proposed homes could open. In Houston, Texas, for example, in March of 1864, they didn't have enough funds. They had collected some, but they were returning them because they hadn't collected enough to get it together. But for some reason, or at some point, um, things did turn around because they were able to open a home after all, about August 1st. So, what were these homes actually like? They got these things set up various places, and certainly, as you can gather, they, have, they differed drastically from place to place. Some of them were in pre-existing buildings, others in newly constructed ones. Some were set up in homes. Uh, the home in Vicksburg, where Patty Wiswell worked, was, as she put it, a very large dwelling house with large piazzas and halls. And at times, they would have just people, soldiers, lying all over the area because they didn't have enough beds for them. In Memphis, the Christian Commission home uh, was in a two-story mansion. It had, had nine rooms on the first floor, and it had formerly been the home of a rebel, being put to entirely different use, um, since it was Union soldiers that they were caring for here. The uh, hospital in Centralia, when it set up its own home, um, rented a recently vacated store for $4 a month. Caro um, had two buildings near the railroad station and the steamboat landing. And in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, their, their wayside homes were in a hotel and a store. Springfield, of course, uh, newly constructed theirs. It was a one and a half story building that was you know, a 40 by 100 foot building. The Chicago Soldiers Rest, the, the new one that they built, was on the lake shore fronting Dearborn Park between Randolph and Washington Streets, and so some of you probably know where that was. 
but it was it was a large building, 50 feet by 200, and they divided it into 50 foot square rooms. They had bunks all around uh, the walls and stoves for heating and cooking, and obviously could house quite a few people temporarily. So what was it like for the soldiers who stayed there? Uh, some actually commented upon their experience, either in a letter or a, um, a diary. James M. Taylor, who's one of my favorite soldiers to work with, um, was a, a sergeant in the 96th Illinois Infantry. And he was going to Nashville, Tennessee. He was uh, down in Alabama. And he was going up to Nashville to take an exam for promotion, hoping to be promoted to lieutenant. I, I think he was really looking to be um, made an officer in one of the colored regiments, uh, which did not happen. But at any rate, he went up to Nashville, and while he was there, he found that the, the soldier's home there was a good place to clean up, to get food, and to store his luggage. But it was so full that either he had to sleep sitting up or on a bench, and so he finally uh, went and stayed in a hotel. But he came back and, and ate and uh, cleaned up and so forth and hung out in the soldier's home. William Wiley uh, had experience at two of the Illinois soldiers' homes. In Springfield, he had to sleep on the floor, which he didn't specify whether this was because they didn't have any beds or because their beds were full. But he slept on the floor there, and so he was kind of happy to report that at Cairo, he was able to sleep uh, in a feather bed uh, on an iron bedstead in a dormitory that had 58 beds. And their other dormitory room was even larger than that one. Now, as, as the sleeping accommodations varied, so did the food. James Taylor claimed that he dined, dined at most sumptuously in Nashville, although he did not specify what that meant exactly. Joe Yegi, we already heard about at the very beginning, had coffee, meat, and bread at three meals in Chicago. William Wiley had bread, butter, currant sauce, and coffee for breakfast at Cairo in June of 1864. And he shared that breakfast with 229 other men. At Springfield, um, although the sleeping accommodations weren't so good, breakfast was bread, potatoes, coffee, and ham. So, not so bad. John Barber, who was in the 15th Illinois Cavalry and was being discharged in Little Rock, um, staying at the home there while waiting for his discharge. And he didn't put in any commas in what he noted in his diary, so it's hard to say whether he had boiled hog, fat bread, and hot slop, or boiled hog fat, bread, and hot slop. <laughs> but whichever it was, you know, he didn't appear to be terribly impressed by, by what he was fed. Uh, Patty Wiswall, though, uh, noted that on March 13, 1864, she served breakfast to 400 to 500 men at the Vicksburg home. And she said that they had codfish with gravy, kraut, beans, good meat, good bread, and good coffee, and all the brown sugar they want. So, you know, they had a pretty substantial meal if you want codfish and sauerkraut for breakfast. <laughs> but, you know, this is doubtless better than hardtack, for sure. The medical services provided at the hospitals tended um, to be provided on an as-needed basis by local doctors. In most cases, the facility itself did not have a doctor on its staff, except for a couple of the Confederate wayside homes in Demopolis, Alabama, Paula, Alabama. But by and large, other places, local doctors either visited regularly or came when called. But they they certainly treated a good many patients um, between August and October of whatever year this was recorded. Uh, Dr. Grimes in Washington, D.C. had treated more than 400 soldiers at the, the soldiers' rest there. Uh, in Chicago, it, 
his monthly report of December 12, 1863, Dr. John Hollister indicated that he had dispensed medicines to or treated the wounds of 192 soldiers, so basically in a month. Uh, many of them wounded from Chickamauga, who were on their way home then to recover further. In Augusta, Georgia, the Wayside Home published at one point that it uh, furnishes shelter and refreshment to those who arrive prostrated by sickness and painful wounds and exhausted by loss of sleep and fatigue of travel. Ice water to drink, a basin of cool water, a towel and a clean shirt await each sick or wounded and toil-worn soldier, and a surgeon to dress his wound, after which a comfortable meal is provided and he is then conveyed carefully back to the railroad car. If the soldier prefers to lay over for a day and night to rest, or if this condition requires it, a clean and comfortable cot, and physicians and servants to wait on him are provided for. So, was this always the case? Of course not. But it or something like it really was the goal that these um, women and men um, had for their soldiers' homes, the ideal that they really wanted to reach, that the soldiers would be properly cared for when they came to their place. So what was the effect of the soldiers' homes? Thousands of soldiers were assisted, certainly. Um, at Vicksburg, for example, between August 6, 1863, when the home opened, and May of 1865, they served a total of 115,300 soldiers. 209,760 meals, 93,412 nights lodging. So, you know, a substantial, you know, really a vast amount of soldiers were assisted here. You know, in Centralia, it's entirely different, 195 total sick and wounded. But still, those 195 certainly needed help. In Chicago, in March of 1865, they were aiding thousands of soldiers every week coming through the soldiers' rest. The Sanitary Commission, Western Sanitary Commission, in its final report said that through the soldiers' home, men were saved from large hotel expenses, from extortion and imposition, and often from exposure and suffering through inability to procure a place of rest in a temporary home. So basically, Thousands of men in the Civil War, both North and South, received food, shelter, medical care, and sometimes uh, minor social services that were dispensed to people who could not have paid for them and would not have known how to find them, even if um, they could have paid for them in the strange towns. Soldiers' homes that I know of were located in at least 41 locations um, in 17 states and the District of Columbia. Not only did they help many of these men, but they were a tangible way for women and civilian men and some children to support their soldiers and their country in the midst of a brutal civil war. And clearly, the, the work that they did should not be as forgotten as it has been. Thank you. Any questions? Obviously, some soldiers must have died in some of these stations. Did the soldiers' homes um, help to either arrange for local burial or for the shipment of the remains? Yes. Uh, in Centralia, for example. Um, what I found also at, at the library was um, that the papers of uh, the lady who had served as, as secretary of their Ladies' Aid Society. So the papers weren't extensive, but they gave their statistics. They listed many of their patients and stuff. And so between that and the newspaper accounts, I was able to find out more of that. And they had, I think, about... 10 or a dozen soldiers who died and who were buried there in Centralia. And so I think the same was, was true of other places. You know, if somebody's 
um, family want their remains, they would ship them on, but otherwise they would bury them. And you know, they, they listed the amount of money that they spent for burial expenses. Yeah. I have several questions. <laughs> um, when I was a little boy, my father, 65 years ago, my father took me to Stephen Douglas' burial site in Chicago on 35th Street. Across the street, there was a place called Rondelay Lying in Hospital. Um, and there was a sign there, which I don't think is there anymore, that said that this had been a hospital during the Civil War for Union troops. Is that one of the soldiers' homes? Probably not, because I think there were, there were actually some hospitals in Chicago, or at least one, because I know that um, that there, there was a, a wide system of behind-the-lines hospitals, you know, really behind the lines, and that Chicago, Quincy, and Springfield all had them. And when Illinois soldiers ended up in hospitals in Indiana and other places, they're wanting to come to one of these hospitals, be transferred to one of these hospitals in Illinois instead. And I think that that's probably more likely to be that. Your thoughts on Mercy Street? Um, I watched only the first episode. And, you know, in reality, all of those things wouldn't have happened in one night. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Uh -huh. Is there anything in this country today that emulates what was going on back then, the generosity of the public toward people in need. Without any reward, I mean, most of these people were volunteers, they were giving, getting nothing back. Is there anything going on in this country today where people don't get paid to do something for someone else? Oh, I think there are a lot of charitable efforts of all different kinds. Um, maybe not on the same scale as this or exactly the same, you know, a military sort of situation. But there are all different kinds of charitable efforts. Um, so I, I'm not even sure where to start, but certainly there are assistance for various kinds of refugees, um, help for many kinds of disadvantaged people. So yeah, I think there are all kinds of voluntary things. It's not but it's not the same kind of um, well you don't have somebody calling you in the middle of dinner saying that this is they're a paid caller raising funds for thus and such. Yeah. Just a just just a point of reference. The, the, the young lady's name was the cook at Pittsburgh, who was a prominent actor or character in your talk. Her oh, name was Harriet Wiswall. W I S W A L L. Wiswall. Harriet. Yeah, and she was she was the niece of um, Owen Lovejoy. You see, oh, oh, his niece. His what niece, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I think it was his niece, uh, related in some way like that. Were the homes or the rest of the South, Charleston, and could they continue to the end of the war, or did they kind of peter out because of the conditions? Um, you know, it depended on where they were and what the needs were, because always it was. Um, you know, are people still coming through here and needing this service? And of course, if, if the railroad isn't working, there aren't going to be people coming through. Um, but, you know, just like with the hospitals, they did the best they could. Yeah. Uh, my my great, great grandfather uh, was in the soldier's home in Leavenworth, Kansas. And uh, died in the 1890s there and, and was uh, buried in the National Cemetery there. And I'm just wondering if, I know I've got some records, but they're pretty sketchy. Is there places to go to find 
more details about what, what, you, what you might have experienced there? Uh, there are there are a number of books on on veterans and soldiers' homes that have come out in the last couple of decades, um, and I'm I'm trying to think offhand. Um, there there's one on on the southern soldiers' homes. I can't remember the title of it. That's by Randy Rosenberg, or Randall Rosenberg. Um, there's, there are also um, some publications from the era, like the 1890s and so, that, that you might be able to find, um, like a major research institutions. I know that, that the Presidential Library has some publications that were put out, like by the soldiers from Danville and Quincy, um, and so you might be able to find some. Otherwise, you might be able to, if you looked, um, try searching on on WorldCat um, because you get a wide variety of, of catalogs from libraries around the country. It's it's not always the easiest thing to use. But if you try um, searching under soldiers' homes and the state that you're interested in, you might have some luck at least getting titles that you can hunt for and you can see who's got them. You may be able to get some things uh, through interlibrary loan for your, from your local library, depending. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You have a and so uh, this is a little bit of a two-sided question here. You've got a lot of detail about how many meals are served in so many locations and so on. So the big question is, where do you find that stuff? No. <laughs> and the second part, and the real part of this is you talked about a cow that did not make it. So tell me more about that and where did you find it? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think because, of course, I didn't put all my notes. But I got a lot of information out of the newspapers, period newspapers. Uh, also, there are the, those collections that I mentioned that are at the Presidential Library. Um, some of the soldiers saying their experience, um, Patty Griswold's letters, the, um, the Centralia Ladies' Aid Society, their papers, a small collection. Um, there's also some official papers that were published by the Illinois State Sanitary Commission, the Western Sanitary Commission. The Sanitary Commission itself, um, and I am sure that there's more stuff out there. Uh, my plan is to spend a lot more time in a lot more newspapers, but I haven't had the time to do that. But now <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I'm hoping that I will actually get more done with this. What was the name of the cow? The cow. You know, <laughs> I don't believe they told. <laughs> sorry. It's <laughs> time to learn that. I'm sorry. What, what relationship, if any, was there between you know, these homes and what we all previously thought of as old soldiers? Well, clearly there was some here because there's the idea that people um, are going to need help, that the disabled soldiers are going to need help after the, the war. Um, because in Chicago, for example, they discovered that there were some people who were not leaving the soldiers' rest, and they needed some place for them to go, and so that was when they started working on a permanent home for them. And so they've got, by the end of the war, they've got about 60 people living in the permanent home, and they've got thousands of people going through the soldiers' rest every week. So it, a lot of it would depend, of course, on the size of the population, the size of the wounded population that came home, you know, really permanently disabled. And the, the pensions that they received were based on their ability to do manual labor. And so if they couldn't do manual labor because of their, their injuries or their illness, they could receive a pension. So James Taylor, who I mentioned, 
uh, eventually was wounded in the arm and had an amputation. And so he received uh, a pension for the rest of his life because of it. Although he went on and became a very successful lawyer in Taylorville, Illinois. Um, but he, he received, continued to receive a pension. So, but obviously some larger towns developed that, that had a substantial um, you know, disabled veteran population might have at least something for a while, but a number of the states, I think, um, set up, you know, soldiers' homes for the states. Illinois had one in, well, Danville and Quincy, and I don't know if it had more um, earlier on. I honestly don't know because. I have spent most of my time working on soldiers' home during the war as opposed to afterwards. Right, you named at least six towns that had them. How many, how many locations in like, Illinois during the war? During the war had, had these kinds of homes. Um, Cairo, uh, Springfield, Centralia, um, Chicago. Um, Danville didn't then. That that's post-war. And and Quincy, Quincy, I think may have had something. Um, they had a I I've been they had a hospital, you know, a, a real hospital hospital. There was one there in, in Mount City. There was a hospital of sorts in Cairo. Um, but there there was something that I came across in the, the newspaper. About a group of women called the, who called themselves the Needle Pickets, and they had a place where people could soldiers could go on their way through, and they had an advertisement for it in the newspaper. But I haven't been able to find out any more than that. But so they appear to have had something. Not outside of Chicago, not much in northern Illinois. Um, not as much that I know about. Um, so, you know, Milwaukee did, <laughs> but... I was thinking of Rockford, my hometown, or something in that area. That I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not a long time. It, it depends on what's going through their transportation lines. Gotcha. Any other questions? <laughs>